Thank you very much, and we appreciate it. And we appreciate everybody investing their time this afternoon to uh, review this session with us. And we're excited to have you. Let's dive in. If, from an agenda perspective, we're going to talk to you a little bit about CMS. We're going to explain what is WOTC. We're going to give you a little history of the WOTC tax credit programs, the legislation behind it, or how WOTC is a, is a value to both your company, if you work for a company, or for your clients, if you're a CPA firm on how to take advantage of those. We're going to explain how the WOTC program actually works, who's eligible for the WOTC tax credits, what the process is. With that said, uh, it's a lot of information, and we're going to go uh, streamline right through it. CMS. CMS has actually been processing WOTC tax credits for over 20 years now. We've also been in the HR and payroll technology area for the last 20 years. And you're going to see at the end of today's presentation where that technology kind of brings uh, you and your client and how we can help you with that. We developed our online WOTC portal back in 2015, which is all web-based, which helps our clients um, process the WOTC tax credits through us. And we, look, we always look at innovation. We always look at technology. One of our sister companies is also iRecruit, which is a full applicant tracking application that we're involved in as well. So. Behind a lot of this, technology is our core. WOTC stands for Work Opportunity Tax Credit. So the whole basic underlying component of the WOTC tax credit is basically incentives for employers to get people into the workforce. With the main objectives of the program to get people employed, we have them become steady wage earners and contributing taxpayers. Now, I did a study last year on the WOTC tax credits on how much it actually saves the state and fed if an employee works and it's around twelve thousand one hundred and eighty five dollars if we can move somebody from unemployment into employment on a monthly basis so this program works economically uh, for both uh, the state and the fed and and uh, also you as employers the whole objective is to really for businesses to help you lower your federal tax liabilities by hiring workers of one of the targeted tax groups that we're going to talk about and to gain a new and valuable employee. So WOTC is all about trying to provide incentives for the employer, getting the employee back into the workforce and getting them to pay as a contributing taxpayer. So a little history of uh, the employment tax credits. Actually, um, the WOTC or Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program is really nothing new. It actually goes all the way back to uh, 1978 under the Targeted Jobs Tax Credit Program for economically disadvantaged folks. Then Reagan uh, kind of took it and actually added it to the Economic Recovery Act in 1981. And then they actually increased some of the categories actually in 1983 to try to create more of a realistic approach to the um, economic struggle of unemployment at that time. The program has been around for 40 years. In 94, um, it was interesting because the Joint Committee on Taxation estimated uh, in 94 that the program target Jackson tax credit program cost taxpayers about $300 million. Keep that number in mind a little bit. I'm going to be sharing some stats later on in, this, in the presentation. So we've, co we've come a long way, <laughs> put it that way. But the federal tax credit program is, uh, has been around for a while to try to help get people back into the workforce. Some of the unique characteristics of the uh, WOTC tax credit program that is uh, different than a lot of the tax credits under the general business tax credit laws under the 3800 is it's actually an IRS legislation, but it's actually administered by the Department of Labor. And I'll go through that administration with you as we go through the process. So it's actually administered by the Department of Labor, but HUD gets involved from a federal empowerment zones and rural renewable zones. So those are all actually managed by HUD, uh, which are one of the categories uh, of a WOTC tax credit that can be obtained. So actually we have three different federal agencies involved in this program which makes it somewhat convoluted and, um, and challenging at points. Just to uh, let you know, the renewal zones are currently in place, but HUD has not renewed the, zone, the federal empowerment zones as of the beginning of this year. They're still working through that. So currently the federal empowerment zones are, are not available. That doesn't mean that something's not going to get passed in the near future and make it retroactive. So that's just a, a highlight on that. that Rural zones are currently available. The federal empowerment zones are not, but that doesn't mean that HUD won't uh, approve that and make it retroactive at some point. 
What companies can take advantage of this program? Well, pretty much all businesses, C-Corps, S-Corps, and LLCs. Obviously, the S-Corps goes, uh, the tax credits go back to the partnership. The LLCs go to the personal. A lot of times we're asked, um, how about nonprofits and municipalities? Well, nonprofits and municipalities don't pay federal corporate taxes, so they're not eligible for the WASI Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program. However, there is one stipulation in that, and that's if the nonprofit, the 501Cs, are hiring military personnel or about to hire a hero program, getting the military back in the workforce, they can get actually a tax credit on their payroll 941 or the nonprofit hires somebody who falls under the About to Hire Heroes program. So that's the only category that nonprofits can take a tax credit on, and those tax credits come off their 941s versus obviously the C-Corp, S-Corps, and LLCs that goes on their 3800s. So what current legislation are we under? Where are we going to go with our legislation? What's coming up new? So that's what I want to cover the next uh, minute or two. The current legislation is actually under the PATH Act, Protecting American Against Tax Hike Act in 2015. It extends the program, the WASI tax credit, to 12-31-2019, which is really 1-1-2020. So it has uh, about another year under this current legislation. It was reapproved. Both the House and the Senate actually did examine the WASI tax credit program under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, last year. Actually, the, the House had it removed from the from the tax credits. The, the Senate had it inclusive of that, and the Senate bill passed, so it was reapproved under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Just to give you a, a little sense, employers are currently receiving about $3 billion in tax credits every year. Now, if we look back at that earlier, 1994 numbers, there was, what, $300 million at that time? So we've come a long way. The employees are receiving about $3 billion in tax credits this year. A couple other little notes. There's no limit on how many number of individuals you hire that can qualify, to new hires to, uh, to qualify under the tax credit and claim the tax credit. One thing I'm going to talk about uh, three or four times throughout this presentation is what is called the 28-day rule. And basically what the 28-day rule means is that employees have to be screened on or before their hire date. And forms, all the forms have to be sent into the DOL, Department of Labor, within 28 days of the employee's start date. So any big employer that hired people 30 days ago and they didn't take advantage of the WASI tax credit, unfortunately, have lost that opportunity. You can't go back in time. There's a 28-day rule, so everything is current. So the current uh, legislation is the PATH Act, the 28-day rule. We, we hear a lot of things politically and through all the different media. Right now, there's a lot of things going on around the world and our economy, and this farm bill is kind of behind the scenes, and it's not getting a whole lot of attention, but it's, but it's huge to the WASI, WASI program. It's, it's actually really big. The farm bill actually has, includes $867 billion in the tax package. It covers a whole host of different programs under that farm bill, but one of the largest ones, as it turns out, is the funding of SNAP, which is Supplemental Nutrition Program. Folks, SNAP is food stamps, basically. And um, currently in the United States, there's about 44 million people that are still receiving state and federal assistance, or SNAP, in the United States today. And under this farm bill, they're looking to actually impose more requirements of people receiving SNAP and food stamps. And they're calling it the able-bodied adults without dependents. And these are people that are between 18 years of age, up to 39 years of age. The, the Republicans are trying to extend that up to 59 years of age right now. So this is where some of the battles are going on in the Senate and the House regarding this bill. The, also, the other requirement that they're looking to do is make work requirements for people receiving SNAP and food stamps. The House has it at 20 hours per, per week. The, the Senate is looking for 25 hours per week. And those could be both work programs, or, you know, actual in-work, working programs, education, but this is the legislation that's currently happening behind the scenes. I don't want to get political on this. <laughs> I just want to state some of the facts of what's going on for you. But um, this, is, this is kind of huge for the WASI program. It also kind of indicates the kind of numbers that we have, which I think are interesting. The Farm Bill, which went back to 2014, 
If you looked at it, the Farm Bill in 2018, had projected costs of $489 billion. And I think the new bill I said was somewhere around $867 billion in packages. So some of these programs are increasing, not decreasing. The interesting part of this Farm Bill is that out of that budget, 80% of that total is up to nutrition, is for nutrition purposes, which is SNAP, folks. And it also covers crop insurance, conservation, commodities, and some of these other areas, insurance for the farmers, uh, which are all terrific, by the way. It's just the, the amount of money that's being spent on some of these state and federal programs like SNAP is incredible. It's, they're big numbers. So, so I just wanted to educate you on that. Other proposed legislation that I, I'm kind of keeping my eye on is last year, 2017, uh, obviously Har uh, Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria hit us and there was a Disaster Relief Act that was put in place for those communities that got hit hard because of that respective hurricane. Well, we have, we have Michael that just hit Florida, so I'm kind of keeping my eye out on hurricane relief for those areas uh, in southern Florida and Tallahassee and Georgia. Last year, they, the Fed put in place what is called an employee retention credit. I don't know if anybody was aware of that or not, but that basically applied to employers that were displaced because of the hurricane or the storm. There was a tax credit of up to uh, $2,400, which is 40% of the first 6,000 wages of people had. If they could not get into work and the employer physically paid them, the employer would get a tax credit for retaining those employees during that troubled time. And that went into effect last year and was and something that I'm kind of keeping my eye on for employers down in the South that can take that applicable tax credit if it comes again in the next uh, couple months. For the retention tax credit, there is some legislation, and everybody get a copy of this handout so you can follow back some of these legislation items for yourself if you'd like to. But again, the tax credit was 40% of the gross wages up to the first $6,000 of wages an employee, so there were $2,400 per employee. So if I was an employer that had 10 people qualified, that would be $24,000 in tax credit savings that I could obtain. If that uh, was a, a key factor for me. And from an IRS perspective, they were just looking for just a, a simple, you know, who the employees were that were paid during the um, storm and the relief of that with the last four digits of Social Security number, the wages paid, the actual tax credit value, and um, the value of that. So. There's no more than a simple calc that goes on here for those employee for those retention tax credits. And they actually go on uh, the IRS form 5884A. That's IRS form 5884A if somebody's trying to take advantage of the retention tax credit. And hopefully we get uh, one for the community down south. So what are the targeted groups? What are the categories of people, if we bring them into the workforce, that I can be qualified to receive a tax credit from them? We talked about SNAP a little bit, 44 million people in the United States. And by the way, that comes out to one out of every four, uh, one out of every seven Americans in the United States are on some form of SNAP, which is a crazy number. But uh, that's it. TANF, which is temporary assistance to needy families, that's typically housing, whether it's short term or long term. We talked about the Vow to Hire Heroes program, qualifying vets, and I'll dive into that a little bit more. Qualified ex felons, people that have been released from uh, state or federal. Uh, programs and we hire them back into the workforce. Matter of fact, we have a big client of ours that's a bakery and that's all the hires is ex-felons and they do a terrific job for them. And they get tax credits for hiring them. Um, we talked about the designated community res residents. Those are the federal empowerment zones in the rural communities. So those are people who live in a rural renewable community um, and that are between the ages of 18 and 39 years of age. They have to meet both of those criteria to uh, receive a tax credit. As I mentioned, the Federal Empowerment Zone are currently on hiatus. HUD has not passed authorization on those yet, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to, and there's gonna be a look back period on that. So we'll keep our eyes open for that. Vocational rehabilitation, these are citizens that are in some of our nonprofit organizations and training programs that if we put them into the work, become um, uh, candidates for a tax credit. The summer youth program, which is obviously only available in the summer between May 1st and uh, September 15th that are in high risk areas. And then social security income, SSI recipients are also a category for a federal tax credit. I will tell you the first two categories, SNAP 
in, in uh, TANF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, represents about 82% of all the tax credits we obtain for our clients. And it's just because of the sheer number of people, I think, that are on those programs. But um, most of the people that qualify under the program, at least for us and our clients, are that SNAP and TANF category. The Vow to Hire Heroes program, you'll see a lot of commercials by big retailers saying we want to hire the military, bring them in, get them into the job, into the workforce, which is terrific. We want that to happen. The employer also gets a tax credit for bringing in that military or vet, that veteran into the workplace. If you look to the bot, to the left, who's eligible? A veteran who's received a service-connected disability is unemployed or receiving SNAP benefits. So if we look at the boxes on the left under that red box, so people with a service-connected disability, that's people that have been hired um, within one year and discharged from service, active duty because of service-connected disability. Now, I will tell you, my nephew went into the Marines, and he was over in the outskirts of Af Afghanistan. He was fooling around one day, he cut his finger with a knife, <laughs> which is a service-connected disability, <laughs> and was released. So whoever hired my nephew would have got a tax credit for um, bringing them back into the workforce. So those are people that are hired within one year of discharge and release from duty as, with a service-connected disability, and that tax credit is $4,800. Now, if the person was unemployed for the last six months in the year ending of the hire date and had a service-connected disability, so unemployed with a service-connected dis disability, we hire them, get them back into the workforce, that's a $9,600 tax credit. And then if they've just been unemployed for four weeks, it's $2,400. If they received SNAP, it's a $2,400 tax credit. If they're unemployed for six months before we hire them and from discharge, that's a $5,600 tax credit. So folks, these, these tax credits can really add up, especially when we're hiring good people for, out of the military to join, join our organizations and getting them back into the workforce. These tax credits can be pretty significant. I'm honing in on this uh, a lot. I'm sorry about that, but it's just a, it's a big category. I think what you're going to find about SNAP is there's more people that receive it than we think, and it's not a good thing or bad thing. It's just reality. The newest category is long-term unemployment recipients. There's roughly about 12.5 million people unemployed. Some people said it, you know, this is a couple of years ago that it was up to 88 million. I, I don't think that's the case. I think it's probably more around that 12 million people in our workforce that are falling in this new category. And the un unemployed recipient, unemployed recipients are people that have lost their job, have been out of work for at least 26 weeks, and this is saying 27, so at the 27th week, they become eligible for the program. And they don't have to be on SNAP or TANF or service-connected disability, they just have to be unemployed for 27 weeks or more. If we hire and bring them into the workforce, that's a tax credit that we can obtain. So that's the newest category, the long-term unemployed recipients. Um, again, I, I know people that probably fell in, under that category that, uh, in those respective tax credits. So here on this slide, what we have for you is just the different categories, the maximum tax credit you can receive for each one of those categories. So as we can see, the SNAP is $2,400. Long-term TANF is actually $9,000. We talked about the military and the service-connected disability people. Those tax credits for uh, service-connected disability from a military vet is six months, uh, $9,600. So, so they can, all these can add up. Now, there are some cal calculations to obtain. If you notice, everything says max tax credit. So I don't want you to elude, elude you. Some of the tax credits might be smaller than that, and I'll show you how we calculate that. Again. 28 day rule, I want to reiterate that you got to start now type of things or you're going to leave dollars on the table. So how, how, how do you obtain these federal tax credits or what process do you have to go through? What do you have to have people fill out? What's, what's the process and, and um, who needs to fill them out? We already went through that businesses that are C-Corps, S-Corps, or LLCs can participate, nonprofits, if only if they're hiring veterans can take a tax credit off the 941s. There's no certain industry that people need to be in. We do see a lot of companies that are in the service industry, the retail, the food industry, distribution, shipping, manufacturing. 
And and typically, a lot of those groups are hiring entry-level personnel into the workforce. So what needs to happen from a process perspective is your new hire needs to complete. This is filled out by the new hire, by the way. So as as you as an employer are hiring somebody in, doing their W-4s and I-9s and their hiring kit, you, you want them to fill out the IRS Form 8850. And the IRS Form 8850 is basically a questionnaire. It's a questionnaire made up of uh, seven questions, and it asks the new hire if they obtain one of these. So if I look on number, if I squint my eyes and I look at number four, it says check here if you're a veteran entitled to compensation for a service-connected disability and you are discharged or released from active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces during the past year. So what you're going to see on this form is there's a lot of double negatives in a lot of cases. I'm a member that of a family that received temporary assistance and needed family for any of the nine months during the past nine months. They're pretty straightforward questions. We're having new hires fill these out. They're, they're signing the bottoms of these, and then there's, they're going on to the next form, which is Department of Labor 9061 document. So you need the new hires to complete both the IRS 8850 and the 9061. The 9061 gets into more nitty gritty questions like number 14, are you a member of a family with C supplement nutrition program, formerly food stamp benefits for the six months before you were hired, yes or no? So altogether, there's about 18 total questions. If I go to the back page here, there's seven on the 8850 and there's um, another 11 on the 9061. So these both need to be completed and your HR department or whoever does your employee administration needs to send those in within 28 days of the employee start date to the Department of Labor. So their local Department of Labor office would obtain or, or would receive these documents. The Department of Labor at that time is going to go through those. You have to understand they're getting thousands of these in per employer. So you could see a lag time on these of anywhere from a couple weeks to six to nine months before the Department of Labor responds to them. And that's a reality. There are some states, actually the state that we're in, which is Connecticut, which is one of the longest periods of time, they're almost at, at a a year and a half backlog before I receive a tax credit uh, update or not. Some states aren't. Illinois is terrific. Um, Florida is real good. So different states around the country have different uh, response times of whether the employee officially qualifies. Because it's one thing that the employee says that that they they meet one of these categories, but they might have checked the box off right. So the Department of Labor has to validate the accuracy of these. If somebody re is receiving SNAP, the, the Department of Labor has to validate that. So the employee is going to fill out, or the new hire is going to fill out the 8850 and the 9061. Those are going to be submitted to the state that they work in, to the Department of Labor in that respective state. The work opportunity tax credit, as I mentioned, can be up to $9,600 for a service-connected disability. If you look into the left, into the green box there, I will tell you our personal experience over 20 years of doing this is 10 to 15 percent of all new hires qualify for um, WASI tax credit, whether you know it or not. So we take the stance um, when working with our employers that they screen everybody. And, you know, it's a consistent process. Just as you're filling out your I-9, your W-4, you fill out the WASI paperwork and you keep consistent. But once I receive a certification back, then we start tracking the dollars and the hours the employee works from their start date. So everybody's on their own fiscal year. So today's October 24th. If I hired somebody today, it would be uh, the wages would be based on this fiscal year, the 24th. So there are some benchmarks that Congress put into place for us. As I mentioned, all those tax credits were the maximum values. What happens, you know, what are the other values that um, are represented? The tax credits can actually equal 25% or 40% of the employee's first year wages. Actually, that's not true. It actually could be zero, then 25%, then 40%, because the employee needs to work a minimum of 120 hours with that respective company to receive a 25% tax credit. So I'll give you an example of an employee that works, say, 125 hours and then, and then quits. Well, what we would do is we take the gross wages of that employee, if he worked over 125, 120 hours, we'd get 25% of their gross wages. So if somebody 
worked 125 hours, made $1,000, that tax credit would be $250 as a tax credit, 25% of that $1,000. Once the employee goes over and works over 400 hours of service, then that's where the 40% kicks in. So over 400 hours is 40% of the first $6,000 of wages, which comes up for that $2,400 number. Over 400 hours of work and the employees qualified, it's a 40% tax credit of the first $6,000 of wages for the standard tax credits like SNAP, which is $2,400. There are some tax credits that go to year two, like the temporary assistance to needy families. If a candidate or a new hire qualifies under that category, that's a two-year tax credit. But the benchmarks are they don't work. If you think about it, they don't work 120 hours, I get nothing. If they work 120 hours and they qualify under one of those categories, I can get 25% of the gross wages. If they work over 400 hours, I get 40% of the first $6,000 of wages. I hopefully that's clear for you, but that's how that's calculated. So if I take an example of an employer that has 500 employees, they hire 200 people per year. I could have made this easy. I could have put 100 people per year. The qualification ratio is 15%. I mentioned anywhere between 10 and 15% of all the people that we work with typically qualify. That's 30 people that uh, qualify for under the WATSI program. I'm using the tax credit of $2,400. is a $72,000 tax credit savings for that employer. And by the way, that's not one year. It's actually because you, we keep we all have turnover in our organizations. Obviously, we're all hiring new people. So that's year over year over year. So um, these tax credits are terrific, and they, they can add up. I will get into how to apply those in a second. So everybody can do this program themselves. Why have a third-party service do it? I'll just give a little plug in. But there are some sensitive questions that you're asking to the new hire. You know, are you receiving SNAP? Or are you to, receiving temporary assistance and needed families? You know, were you released with a service-connected disability? Obviously, a lot of times in your background checks, you're going to get people that are ex-felons. You're going to know that. You're going to publicize that. And you're hiring them for that purpose as well. This legislation stops. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of political angst a lot of times. As a matter of fact, in the PATH Act, the let, our current legislation went for almost a year open without any legislation or passage of that legislation. Our organization actually worked, continued processing them on a day-to-day -day basis. So we worked almost for a year for no charge <laughs> till the legislation passed. And then obviously the state and Fed released those uh, applicable certifications. So, and it is an administrative burden to take care of this. We've employed some technology into this process we actually screen new hires and, and candidates three different ways. We actually have a 1-800 call center that if you want to picture a retail environment where an employee goes into works into their local McDonald's, the employee picks up the phone, makes a three and a half minute phone call, and our representatives walk them through those questionnaires. We also have web technology that's part of the onboarding process that we deploy that allows the employee to answer questions that are really simple. And then um, obviously we're submitting everything electronically to the State Department of Labor behind the scenes to centralize that processing. We are multilingual. Actually, we're, I think, close to 100 different languages in our call center. Our technology indicates to the new hire that their employer, uh, their company is um, participating in a federal program to initiate jobs and we need their participation. And actually our call center representatives say that to the employees, that we need their participation in the program. We've taken the 8850 form and the 9061 form, which was a total of 18 questions. We've narrowed it down to 10 simple questions. These are all web browsers. They just said simply yes and no. Just interesting enough, after we deployed this, we actually got about 33% more qualified responses because we rewrote the questions to be simpler to use, to, to read, to be simpler to answer and to be more of a, a positive ingredient to the question. Or number four, are you a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces? Yes, if somebody puts yes, it asks them the following questions. Were you discharged from service with a service-related disability? So we kind of walk the candidates through so we get more of a positive yes response by using our, some of our tools. And everything's electronic signature, so there's no paper. Our browsers actually translate the language on the screen up to about 100 different languages with a click of a button. 
So it's easy if I have a multicultural hiring community, I can uh, not worry about that and people can understand the questions that they're being asked, which again, is a better and more positive response. We don't require any supporting documents. If you looked at the DOL, the 9061, there's a whole section on the end there that asks for all these different items. We can get these electronically with our different databases. So an HR department doesn't need to necessarily collect any of this, which makes, which makes it real easy from an administrative process. Again, all these things that we're doing to try to make it easy results in uh, more effective tax credits more, and more tax credits themselves, which is more dollars. We give our clients uh, real-time insight of who's going through the program, if they qualify. We're all about visibility and audit, so we can see every new hire that's gone through the process. We can see their actual forms. In the blue section there, you'll see download 8850-9061. Those are the actual forms and PDF that we support. So we have the audit control, the visibility, and we provide that to our clients. And then we provide our clients a, a real-time dashboard, and that dashboard actually tracks the amount of people we actually screen, how many we submitted to the Department of Labor in that respective state, how many have approved, and how many are pending. So in this example, we've actually, for this client, screened over 15,000 people, which is a lot of people, folks. <laughs> but here we go. Here we see start seeing the results in 16 and 17. Obviously, we're not through 18 yet, and there's probably a bunch that are going to come through. But in 2017, we saved this organization a little over $500,000, which is pretty darn good. And that dashboard's applied to our, our, our product. So if you did this at, at your office or you know, within your organization, you're going to have every employee fill out the 8850 and 9061. You're going to submit those to your appropriate Department of Labor, the State Department of Labor, the WATSI division. They're going to then screen that document determine if the employee is qualified and eligible, and they're going to send you back a certificate. And then once you fill that, get that certificate back, you know they're a qualified candidate. And then that's when you start tracking the total hours they're working and the total dollars that they've earned. And you're going to determine whether they're, they've worked over 120 hours. So uh, if they have to work over 120 hours, you'll receive 25% of the gross pay for that person. If they work over 400 hours, it's 40%. So if they work 401 hours, it's 40% of the gross wages up to the first $6,000, which is a $2,400 tax credit. You're going to take all those tax credits and all that work that you just did, and you're going to put it on three lines, one of three lines on the IRS form 5884. Those three lines are the 25% category, the people that fell into that 40% category, and the second year recipients, which is under the 50% category for the second year. That's a $5,000 tax credit. You're going to apply those numbers on three, 1A, B, and C. And then if you look to item number six on the bottom there, you're going to take those numbers and you're going to put them on your form 3800, part three, line B, line 4B. So all that work that you do <laughs> is going to wind up on one line on your IRS return, 3800, part, part three, line 4B. All this information we put out there to be downloaded for the CPA Academy. If you do want to get a hold of us and learn more about our program, our information is here on the screen as well as in that uh, downloadable option as well. So with that said, I'm going to open up to, for Q&A. All right, Lindsay, are you there? You've been uh, pretty active I'm, in the questions. Yes, Lindsay, I, can, um, I, can I think your everybody was really, really active today. I answered a lot of questions. So the first one I have asked you was, when should I claim the credit? You want to claim the credit. Um, okay, there's a couple of different ways to look at the WATU programs. The challenge is, is the Department of Labor could be up to a year before they give you a certification back. So there's two different theories. Either you go and you open up the prior year and you, you claim those tax credits on that 5884 and then, you know, redo your return, which in this case is going to get you a, a refund based on what you've already submitted. The uh, other thought process is, is you don't realize, the key word is realize, you don't re realize the value of that tax credit till you get qualified voucher back and you know the qualified earnings based on the employee start year. So in a lot of cases, I might have somebody who starts in, in January, um, excuse me, December of 2017, I might not get the tax credit back till 2018 in their wages, I won't know to the 2018. So I would take those on my 2018 return. 
Another question from Natalia. Do they have to claim tax credit twice if new eligible employee works for two years full time? No. So there's a first year tax credit for the same person. You're going to get a specialized certification that's going to indicate that they're a long-term TANF recipient. So you're going to take the tax credit on the first year and you're going to get actually 50% up to the first $10,000 of wages the second year. So yes, you'll claim it twice, once in, say, 2017 and once on your 2018 under the applicable category. Okay, I've got another question for you here. Is it legal to make it mandatory that new hires fill out the 8850 and 9061 form? It is voluntary. It is, it is, voluntary. is not, yeah. it's not mandatory, but let me say this. If you look at the IRS 8850 instructions, they actually indicate that as an employee, you could have your applicants fill that, those documents out, the IRS 8850 and the 9061, and you can make your hiring decision based on if somebody qualifies or not. Okay, I think we've got time for one more. Um, quite a few people actually ask, um, how much does CMS charge for your WOTC services? We charge, we're actually contingency-based service. Our, our fee is based on the volume that we do with our clients, so I would say reach out to Sean. Sean Kelly, we can understand how many employees that you hire and try to give you some pricing, but it's, I can tell you it's very fair, and we don't get paid unless we save you money. All right, and with that, we are just about ready to wrap up. So, Brian, Lindsay, do you have any concluding thoughts before we wrap up the webinar? Yeah, take advantage of the WASI tax credits. They're there for you. It's great legislation. All right, and that'll do, up, that'll do for this hour. Thank you all for your time and attendance, and we hope to see you all on future webinars. Take care.